Here we're going to look at a particular form of a detector or a hypothesis stress testing procedure known as the likelihood ratio test. We're going to begin with the problem of a binary hypothesis test where we're deciding between two hypotheses, H1 and H0, and as we've seen before, we can do such a test by forming a test statistic T using the observed data X and comparing that test statistic to a threshold. And the question is, what should we choose for this test statistic? And we'd like our test statistic to give us good performance. And we can characterize performance, recall, by quantifying something called the probability of a correct detection, which would be the probability that we decide H1 is true when H1 is really true. So that's the probability that our test statistic is greater than the threshold eta given that H1 is true. And if we have a probability for distribution or density function for the test statistic, FH1 of t, then we can express this probability as the integral from eta to infinity of the probability density function with respect to t. And that's just the area under the density from eta to infinity. So that's our probability of making a correct decision about H1. And it's conventional to also look then at the probability of incorrectly deciding that H1 is true, or what we've called the probability of false alarm. This is the probability that we decide H1 when H0 is really true, and that's simply the probability that our threshold, or that our test statistic is greater than the threshold under the condition that H1 is true. So in this case, we have a probability density function for our test statistic under hypothesis H0, and the area under that probability density function from eta to infinity gives us a probability of a false alarm. So that characterizes the performance of our test with respect to falsely deciding or incorrectly deciding H1 is true. We can put both of these together into something called a receiver operating characteristic, which shows how the probability of detection and the probability of false alarm vary with respect to changing the threshold eta. So as eta increases, the probability of detection decreases, and the probability of a false alarm also decreases. So when we look at this kind of a performance characterization, it brings us back to criteria for choosing a good test procedure T of X. And that's our goal, is to find a test procedure T of X that has very good performance. In other words, it, of all possible tests, we would like the receiver operating characteristic to be as close to this northwest corner as possible, because that means perfect detection with zero false detections. Now in general, it's very difficult to identify an optimal test procedure. But in the case where the hypotheses are simple, that is when the probability density functions of the data under hypothesis one and under hypothesis zero are known completely, then we have something called the name and Pearson lemma that tells us what the optimal test should be. So we observe vector x, and we say then that the test which maximizes the probability of detection for any given probably the false alarm is something known as a likelihood ratio. And that's the ratio of the probability density functions under H1 evaluated at our observed data x to the probability density function under H0 evaluated at our observed data x. And that is greater than a threshold, we're going to decide H1 is true, and when that's less than the threshold, we'll decide H0 is true. And we'll choose our threshold to obtain the desired probability of false alarm. In other words, again, L here is our ratio, and that has a probability density function under the hypothesis 0, we'll call that FH0 of L. So the probability of false alarm is simply the area under this density from gamma to infinity. Now this is called a likelihood ratio test because it involves the likelihood. Now here I'm going to use a straight x to represent a random variable and my curly x to represent the observed value of the data. So if I ask this question, what's the probability that 
a random variable x is very close to my observed data x squiggle or x curly and we can say that the distance is say within epsilon and I can write that as the integral over the probability density function for x between x minus epsilon and x plus epsilon and I'm being a little bit uh, sloppy in terms of notation here writing this as a one-dimensional problem to make my point that if epsilon is small this is just the probability density function evaluated at the observed data times epsilon and you can see that from a curve like this so here I have my probability density function of the data x random variable in green and then for any particular observation curly x the uh, probability that I get a value close to that observation is given by f of curly x, this height, times some width. And that's what we would say is the likelihood of observing x. So our likelihood ratio test is a very intuitive idea. And it says we're going to compare the likelihood of observing a value x given that h1 is true. We're going to compare that to the likelihood of observing x assuming h0 is true. And so if x really came from h1, our hope is that the likelihood of observing x given h1 will be significantly larger than the likelihood of observing x given h0, and therefore we would choose h1. Now the name and Pearson lemma, we can prove that actually mathematically that it does indeed maximize probability detection for any given probability of false alarm. We're not going to do that here, but it's not too hard to show that the likelihood ratio is indeed the optimal test for the highest probability of detection at any given false alarm probability. So let's do an example, and this simple example will have two hypotheses under hypothesis zero. Our data consists of capital N samples of noise. Under hypothesis one, our data has a signal embedded in it, S of n, plus noise. And we'll assume that S of n is known and that the W, the noise, is Gaussian distributed with zero mean and variance sigma squared and that we know sigma squared. So in this case, we know everything about the data under each hypothesis and this is a set of simple hypotheses. Recall that if some of the parameters, say sigma squared, were unknown, then this would be a composite hypothesis testing problem. But because we know all these parameters, it's going to be simple, and therefore the optimal test is to use the likelihood ratio. So we need to derive the probability density function of the data under hypothesis H0 and under hypothesis H1. And it's fairly straightforward to do. For notation, we're going to collect all the samples of the signal into a vector s, and this will be a column vector. We'll also collect the samples of the noise into a vector w, which is a column vector as well. And then under hypothesis 0, my observed data x is just a sample of the noise w, and I can write the probability density function for my observed data as a Gaussian with zero mean and covariance matrix sigma squared i, and that density is expressed in closed form as one over two pi quantity two pi sigma, one over the quantity two pi sigma squared raised to the n over two times the exponent of negative one over two squared x transpose x. Under hypothesis H1, my data now has a shift, in other words, the signal is present, so it's noise plus the signal, and the signal is known, so in the probability density function for my data, the signal shows up as the mean, and my covariance matrix is still sigma squared i. So now I basically have the same probability density function as under H0, except in the exponent I have x minus s transpose times x minus s transpose. Clearly setting s equal to 0 gives us what we had under, s, under H0. So with those two probability density functions, I can form the likelihood ratio, which is the ratio of the probability density function under H1 to that under H0. And when we look at the ratio of these two quantities, the 
terms out front are going to cancel out because they're the same in both. And then when I have a ratio of exponents, that's the same as taking the exponent of the difference, the quantities. And so I end up with this likelihood ratio being exponent negative 1 over 2 sigma squared times the quantity x minus s transpose x minus s minus x transpose x. So it's very common with exponential densities to simplify things by taking a logarithm because the log is a monotonic function and thus it's not going to change the characteristics of the test. So my original test involved looking at whether the likelihood ratio is greater than a threshold. I can replace the likelihood ratio with L prime, which is the log of L of X, and ask whether the log of L of X is greater than the log of the original threshold. And in this case, then, L prime of X is negative 1 over 2 sigma squared times S transpose S minus 2 S transpose X. And I obtained this by multiplying all the terms out in here and subtracting X transpose X, which cancels the X transpose X here. Now it turns out that we can further simplify this test by taking the known quantities that showed up in L prime, that is sigma squared and S transpose S, and absorbing those into the threshold, or basically doing algebra on each side of the expression. So we're going to take L double prime of X to be L prime of X times 2 sigma squared plus S transpose S whole quantity divided by 2, and that leaves us with just S transpose X being compared to a threshold gamma double prime, where gamma double prime is this same algebraic operation applied to gamma prime. So we have gamma prime 2 sigma squared plus S transpose S divided by 2. And if this simple now test statistic is greater than gamma double prime, I'm going to decide H1 is true. If it's less than gamma double prime, I'm going to decide H0 is true. Now this test statistic is something that's called a matched filter and basically S transpose X, if we go back to the signal notation involving S of N and X of N, it's just the sum from N equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of S of N times X of N. And so we've in a sense filtered our observation X with a signal that matches the signal we're trying to detect. This doesn't exactly look like a filter because there's a convolution involved in filtering, but uh, we're not going to go into details on that. But it, you can show that this is the output of a match filter at a particular instant in time. So now to find the threshold to get a particular, probably a false alarm, we need to find the PDF of our test statistic, S transpose X, under hypothesis S0. Well, under H0, the data X is normal 0 sigma squared I, so it's fairly simple to show that S transpose X is normal 0 sigma squared S transpose S. Now for convenience, I'm going to let a new random variable Z be S transpose X, and we can write the probability of false alarm as the area under the density for Z from gamma double prime to infinity. So I can write down my normal probability density function that I've expressed here, and you can see that I've just got a variance of sigma squared S transpose S, so that shows up in the scale factor in the front, as well as in the denominator of the exponent term, and that's a Gaussian distribution with zero mean, and so I've got some threshold gamma double prime that I want to find the area under this distribution from gamma prime to infinity, and, I'll call, and that's my probability of false alarm. Now, if you have a given probability of false alarm and want to find the threshold, it turns out that's a fairly easy problem to solve with a computer. So we can find the threshold that gives us a desired probability of false alarm. So let's take this a little bit further and characterize the performance by looking also at the probability of detection. To do that, we need to know the distribution of our test statistic, which was S transpose X, under hypothesis H1. And it's fairly easy to show that under H1, this random variable Z, which is S transpose X, is a normal random variable. It has mean S transpose S and variance sigma squared S transpose S. So the variance stays the same under H0 and H1, it's just under H0 we had zero mean, and under H1 we have a mean of S transpose S. 
So we can write the probability of detection as the area from gamma double prime to infinity under this density. So it's this shown here in the shaded pink. It's the probability of detection. And this too is something that can be evaluated with the computer. And once I fix the probability of false alarm, that gives me a particular threshold, gamma double prime. And it turns out you can show that the probability of detection depends only on something called a signal to noise ratio, which is the energy in the signal divided by the variance of the noise. And can write that in two ways here. If I substitute for the vector s, it's just the sum of the squares of the signal normalized by the noise variance. So I've computed the receiver operating characteristic for some different values of signal to noise ratio in this particular problem and shown them here. And you can see that when the signal to noise ratio is very small, as shown by the black curve where we've got 0.1, the, it's difficult to get very good performance. In fact, the performance lies very close to the chance line, which would be the diagonal that corresponds to ignoring the data and flipping coins. And then as the signal noise ratio increases, our performance improves. And finally, when we get to a signal noise ratio of 10, we're able to get a fairly high probability of detection with reasonably small probability of false alarm. So the likelihood ratio test is the optimal test for simple hypotheses. We have binary simple hypotheses. The best you can do, meaning the highest probability of detection for a given false alarm probability, is to use a likelihood ratio test.